when we are doing a commentary, you could bring an elephant on stage. I guarantee it. Welcome everybody, we're doing a fan commentary today for 2016's The Boy. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day when I saw this film, uh, well, when I saw this film, well, more than when I saw this film for the first time, but when I saw this uni new Universal logo, and it was for the 100th anniversary of Universal Studios, and I think it's amazing how quick you can get blasé and just used to things, because if you look at all the Universal logos in sequence, you know, they start off like in black and white, and, you know, quite rudimentary special effects and things, oh, we said rudimentary, and then, um, when I saw this logo, and it was like, I think it was on YouTube, and I was watching it like in widescreen, and it's like, da, 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 and a big, huge universal coming around. And now it's like, ah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and it's like, okay. Uh, yeah, but it's, um, with a lot of these commentaries, um, probably be like a jumping off point for um, a lot of things, and with this one in particular, it'd be everything ventriloquism. And I know this isn't strictly a ventriloquism dummy movie, but as soon as I saw the trailer for this movie, the very first thing that popped into my head was, oh my god, it's a ventriloquist dummy movie. I don't know if it's just because when I was growing up, my mum used to be really into it. I know these, again, these aren't those movies but um, my mum used to really love the child's play movies like you know she'd buy them on video and watch all the time stuff and I used to and I, I used to be a big fan of horror movies and I, I grew up watching Magic the and I'll go into that in greater detail later on the uh, Anthony Hopkins uh, Rich Attenborough movie uh, but this is probably one of the most underrated subgenres of horror movies ever because it seems to me most people I've either got some memory of seeing like magic or seeing something with a ventriloquist dummy in and it really freaking them out or like even things like the Goosebumps books and things like that but they seem like a genre of movies that isn't ridiculously successful like and it's a this really weird seesaw effect and I know I say it's about a lot of things it's probably what draws me to these kind of commentaries or these kind of subjects but I love it when something can be two completely separate things all at once and like say even when you take a genre anyway like westerns or comedy and then once you once you subsection it or fraction it out a little bit and like when you get things like the eight for late which is like a sci-fi western or when you get sort of cowboys versus aliens or when you get something like um let's try to think of an example some kind of something that isn't a comedy but has got lots of comedy it's very early in the morning by the way uh, that's a cool building i'd love to know if there's any cgi enhancements to that um yeah but when you get certain films that don't necessarily fit into one genre so like say with i always class even though it's a ridiculous thing to say i always class the ventriloquist dummy movies as a sub-genre you know you could just say they're straight out horror for the most part they really are but i always look at like the ventriloquist dummies or you know like killer doll movies as sort of um, like its own little thing and i guess it is and if and if you do use that as a basis it is really funny that I've got so many memories of these films like over the years and even just doing a little bit of quote unquote research on it recently it's amazing how many there are, like if you start doing a list and there's a really good documentary on uh, the magic DVD just all it's called Fats and Friends and it's all just about ventriloquism like you know from you know the 17th century and you know when it started becoming popular on vaudeville and you know the different movies and things like that and even that is a really in-depth documentary really good really well researched really well put together but at the same time i don't know if i've missed the uh, daniel pearl credit to uh, cinematographer in this film as a uh, good old daniel pearl good should we say good old daniel pearl who lends to um, both texas chainsaw massacres the 74 <laughs> both of them <laughs> that for a Freudian slip um yeah, the 74 one and the Platinum Dream remake and not counting none of the others <laughs> and he uh, did uh, Van Halen's live uh, video 
yeah, but even though as good as this documentary is, um, it only really mentions three or four movies. And this documentary must have been made early 2000s, something along in that ballpark. So it's not like it was made in like 1981. And there's tons of stuff it doesn't mention. Or, or there's at least tons of TV stuff it doesn't mention. And that's one thing though as well when saying about certain sub-genres of things. And I can remember, I think it was Scott Spiegel on the 25th anniversary of Night of the Living Dead, when he was saying how influential it was. And I could tell on the interview, a bit like I do now, drawing a blank of all the things that it did influence, because it did influence so many different things. You could you could only like think of about two, and it was... But when you'd like something like Night of the Living Dead, once you look at all the things it's influenced, it's you know, all these video games and books and novels and fan fiction and the zombie genre in general, and it, you can just cut this massive list. And it's like, I'm going to use this to want to do the blog post portion of this commentary to come up, try to come up with either a definitive list or a really good, strong top 10. And I think that's one thing about, like, say, this subgenre of movies is sometimes even if somebody just catches me off guard and says, well, no, not that this ever happens, but if somebody said, oh, recommend five killer dummy movies for me, and not just five child's play movies, you know, you think, oh, okay, Magic and uh, you know, Dead Silence, and, you know, yeah, but once you start going into it, it's... There's so many different ones, and even like say, as recent as the Goosebumps movie that came out recently, and you've got the Goosebumps books now to live in dummy. Again, a nice little coincidence there. Oh, that was one scene. This is one scene I could almost see a lot of people sort of you know nowadays how everybody thinks oh they're the world's best film critic and stuff. Like, but this scene here where they gain all the shopping out of the bags because. As soon as I realised this film was filmed in England, I thought, oh, here we go. Because even though I love either way, I love it when... Even though it can be kind of embarrassing sometimes, because sometimes when they film a film in the UK, and, you know, it's like, oh, my God, the food sucks, we drive hilarious cars and, you know, roundabouts and all these different things. And on the one hand, I really love that, because it's like it gives the country a real sort of personality and its own, its own thing. Um but I was, as soon as she pulled up to this house, that London taxi, I was like, I don't think this is the UK. And I thought that was as far as it would go, really. I thought you'd, they'd never really mention anything else about it. But when they started pulling all this shopping out the bag, and it was like Heinz beans and uh, Quaker porridge oats and all these different things, uh, that I was just like, oh, that is really cool because I think I think it was filmed in Canada, I think, if I, if I remember the credits correctly. And you think somebody somewhere, I know everything nowadays is kind of quote, quote unquote online, but even if you actually literally just go to one of these shops where you can order English food, which sounds like some kind of weird jackass uh, endurance challenge, but uh, yeah, that somebody somewhere ordered all this English food and like, you know, like, and every so often there'll just be these little nods to it, you'll see something on the shelf and yeah, just like, say, I don't know if it's just like, uh, I'm really zeroing in on it. And I think they even got like, like the props just right as well because I think that's something like with and again like with like especially like you know not dead generic mainstream horror but if you like those tea cakes out of the mic it's unbelievable um chocolate tea cakes no, no less but once you start sort of try and do these films I think like you know little things like and I think that's where I think why I've got such an appreciation for movies is I think a lot of people could watch this scene and go, yeah, they're in room. And that's true. That's that's all that's all it is. But, you know, when you've got to make sure the iron looks like an, an iron that you could buy in Europe or the microwave looks new enough to be a microwave in a microwave that exists, but not new enough so it doesn't break the aesthetic of this room. Do you ever find really strict older women attractive? Yeah, no, me neither. Uh, but, yeah, and I think that's one thing about movies that really doesn't get nowhere near enough credit. And even people that I think know a little bit about filmmaking or 
the people I've talked to over the years about like film editing or film, which, which to be fair, nearly every single person I know, is that I think even now, and even people who I would like, you know, people who've got like their own YouTube channel or something, and know how hard it is to create something, even if you are just going outside for 10 minutes and just filming something or you're just, you know, holding up, you know, your collectibles and going, oh, I collect this or whatever, you know, and then you've got to load it to the internet and, you know, hope you don't get flagged and all these different little things and do a thumbnail and all this stuff. And, and even though there's loads of people that do that now, I'm amazed the amount of people that can watch something like this and go, yeah, like, all those people turned up in their own clothes and they, they did their own hair and you know like and you know the the, the the film loaded itself into the camera and there was a set there and the, that dummy was there and stuff and it's little things like that that I still to this day find fascinating uh, but yeah like say looking at like ventriloquist doll dummy movies is that I re and I made this analogy the other day but I really think it's really apt is that these little packets of salt or sugar that you get sometimes from like you know, McDonald's or a cafe or something if you opened one of them threw it in the air where all the little grains of sugar or salt would just go everywhere wouldn't they and I kind of almost look at these killer dummy movies a bit like that where like I say and I'm sort of you know, again always ping ponging back and forth the seesaw effect I'm really proper contradicting myself but again I think it's true is there and I really think as well this is a great premise as well to throw me on topic for a second is that like uh, you know the fact that she's like yeah I'm looking after a doll that's not insane but that's one thing as well talking about the production design that like one thing I always think a lot of um, films really struggle to get right uh, so I've got a hair in my mouth <laughs> so, made me think of Christine bonus points if you know what you've seen I'm on about but um, yeah, is that like I think the production design in this film is brilliant. Like I said, they've got all the, the clothes seen, the clothes she's wearing seen right. The clothes, uh, the, when I'm saying she, I'm pointing with my eyes. The the clothes the younger woman is wearing seem right. The clothes that the older woman is wearing seem right. The the things on the shelf seem right and things like that. But one thing I always think movies really really struggle to get right is photographs, paintings and newspapers. I think you can nearly always tell, and especially in modern movies and new air quotes, is that I always feel like you can tell a photograph oh one second. Cat wanted to leave the room. Um Yeah, uh, modern photographs, I don't feel like a lot of them are done digitally, uh, but I think it's been like this for years to be fair. You can, uh, if you see a photograph in a movie, now this has been real care done to it, it always looks a bit like, oh they've just asked him can you bring in a photograph of yourself when you were like, you know, 13 or something, or newspapers is another one. If you ever see anybody looking at a newspaper, they always look, or to me anyway, really, really fake. So now I've got the window open, line a bit of fresh air, but it's created some cool ambience because we're still to some birds uh, chirping. Now that's nothing as well. Oh, she just put that record on there. But that's one thing though where, and I'll say this in every other commentary, but it's this weird myth that gets keeps getting um, put out there, like that people don't know what records are, or people don't know what phones with cords are. And I always genuinely think that, like, and even though it doesn't really bother me, it really bothers no, even though it doesn't really bother me, I always think, if you didn't know what a vinyl record was, what the hell do you think they are? Like, oh, there's a bottle of uh, Worcester sauce there on the uh, table as well, with the HP as well, <laughs> HP. <laughs> do you ever get nostalgic for stuff that still exists? Um, but, um, yeah, that, so, there's all these, oh, uh, oh, this young generation, uh, a post-Cisco world and all this kind of stuff, and you think, well, it just, I just, like, so I think, I'm, if anyone's listened to the 14 minutes of this country so far, that's a bit of a text to Massacre reference, that's really, uh, and that's one thing, again, I'm really terrible for this, because they say um, the DOP in this film is Daniel Pearl, like I said, who did this 74 text to Massacre, 
and all the way through it, I was kind of thinking, I wonder if he's done that as a bit of a tribute, like like he only worked on one film. Because <laughs> there's one part where you couldn't see out the windows, it was like white. And it always reminds me of the scene in Texas Chainsaw Massacre where they're in the van and um, the, when you pick up the hitchhiker and if you look through the windows, it was just a mistake. Uh, I think it's one of the few mistakes in the film. And uh, it's eight point nine mistakes in film. But um, it was overexposed, so you couldn't see it. The window was just white, and the, the windows were like this at the start. It was like, oh, oh, it's trademark. Um, uh, yeah, but say you now influential and just like it's like a Hydra out the uh, get out there. But how uh, influential killer dummy movies are, and how sort of quote unquote popular they are, because like say in the big scheme of things, if you really you know, it's not like all oh, one being released every two weeks. But there's at least one or two every, say, four or five years. And you'll see them in, like, music videos. And and one thing that really made me want to do a commentary about something to do with ventriloquism or talk about ventriloquism or do, like, a podcast or something was uh, I downloaded a few episodes of Mrs. Columbo, which was, like, the spin-off series of Columbo. And there was one amazing episode in that. I'll have to try and uh, find some stills for it in the blog or something. But um, an amazing commentary set around like a murderer was like a, a ventriloquist that went crazy. And it was brilliant, really proper brilliant. And it's one of these things I remember when um, I went to see a talk by a famous British film critic named Barry Norman. And somebody said to him, what is one kind of film you can always watch, no matter how good or bad it is, or there's one on TV or whatever? And it was, um, he said, westerns, and I'm kind of a bit the same. I mean, I can't watch anything anyway, but like if I see a western on, especially like a new western, I'm like, ooh, new western. Chris Christopherson's making a new western, how cool is that? Oh, it's a Mindy, Mindy cameo. Mindy just, Mindy woke me up by me owing for food, so I, I fed, uh, fed both the cats and um, I thought I may as well do something uh, else productive with the time. Uh, so, here I am, everybody. <laughs> Aren't you lucky people there? There's the old corded phone there. I like that as well because um, in uh, the UK version of Deal or No Deal, they use like a really old phone. I think they call them Bakelite phones, and they, I think they got the balance just right there. That like, and this is one of the few films actually. I really do think this where um, um, somebody says the phone's dead and the phone's working, basically in the same breath. I can't remember which way you wrote it. They like they pick the mobile up and say, "Oh, there's no phone signal," and then they pick up the landline phone and it works. I was like, "Oh wow, that's pretty cool." Uh, yeah, but how influential, how influential um, these kind of movies are. That I, I think, uh, like in, the, let's say, there's this like bit of a myth that oh, what's a phone with a cord on? Like, because there's a line in. I saw the trailer for Bad Neighbors Two or Neighbors, as it's called in the UK. Uh, sorry, it's called Bad Neighbors in the UK, and it's called Neighbors everywhere else because there's an Australian TV show called Neighbors there. It's quite popular in the UK, and so they've changed the title to uh, Bad Neighbours in this country. Uh, but there's one part where Chloe Grace Moret says, you've got an old person's phone when she pulls the phone off the wall and she's running with it and the cord makes it fall over. And so there's this really weird myth of like, like say, that oh, I, I don't know what a phone with a cord is. But then I think if you taught it, most people who were like 15, 16, 17, Jeff Fine, if you, the uh, the woman talking to that ventriloquist, don't be attractive, uh, for anybody who's not watching this synced up, which is probably a lot of people, uh, yeah, but the, uh, people like Chloe Grace Moretz who were like 16, 17, 18, I should imagine that they would have some kind of opinion about killer dummy movies or they would be freaked out by ventriloquist dummies and things like that. And even though that like, kind of I'm quote unquote on the look for these kind of movies, like I say, you don't see them everywhere. You don't see them every five seconds. And like I say, especially through actual list movies, you know they might be a bit few and far between. But the ones that do come out, excuse me, I really do feel like for whatever reason, I don't know if like they fall out of copyright or. You know, they just end up on late night TV somewhere, or they end up in these pound shops or dollar stores. 
and then like say that Mrs. Columbo I saw or there's a, a TV show called a Victorious and there's somebody in that with um, a puppet and stuff a puppet of dummy and um, what was the other show I was watching Angie Tribeca which is like a new version of like Police Squad Naked Gun that kind of thing and there's one episode where it was set around like ventriloquism and things like that and I think there's enough of it out there that it just filters through into all these so you might just see five seconds of an episode of Victorious or you might have caught this episode of Angie Tribeca or like I was talking to my mate Stu the other day and he said he went see this the boy at the cinema I don't know why it completely passed me by I was looking for it and I just missed it just one of the things I guess so yeah that like there might just be one here one there like I was trying to look at the number plate I think that number plate for that uh, uh, Hackney Carriage is uh, I don't think it's a British number plate um and that's another thing though as well I think a lot of the people in this film were British as well and uh, she's in a TV show a British TV show called Doctors I never really watch it but it's one of them shows it's on 300 times a week like because BBC best in the world right and um, but it is just like it's funny because again I put because I reckon and I recognise the older woman I thought where have I seen her before I've seen her in something and she'd been in like all these British TV shows but the woman who plays the main woman in this, I was like, oh, she looks really, really familiar and I couldn't place it. And then I went on IMDb afterwards and it was like, oh, she was Martha Wayne in Batman vs Superman. And I was just like, and that's one thing as well that like, I must have said this a million times, but like, I'm always in like proper loser denial of like going old. And I'm like, nah, 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 because I'm 42 in a couple of months, a couple of months, a couple of weeks. And, uh, so I'm like, oh, you know, I'm not old me. And then, you know, you look at somebody who was born, I think she was born 1980, according to her IMDb page, and she's Bruce Wayne's mum. <laughs> like, you know, like six, seven years younger than me. It's like, when did that happen, you know? Oh, she did peanut butter and jelly. Because she she's American. She just tread wine and people go, ooh, don't get a job, and then she got a job. <laughs> That's one thing though as well. I did a word document and I thought I'd lost it. And as I'll use this as a um, part of the basis for the blog. But I was going through different sorts of um like say that documentary that's on magic and things like that and just remembering different quotes and so I've just put a few here and there's a really good one by William Goldman who, um, who wrote Magic who said nobody knows anything the thing is about the movie business it's true and I kind of love that in a way that like say that like there's a lot of people who might not finance a, a killer dummy movie and that they've lost out on 40 years worth of money but that's one thing I think magic as well. I've heard a few people say they don't like it, and it's really funny because one thing I've got this proper sort of, I don't know what the right phrase is. I'm going to say OCD, but I don't know if it's like if I'm on sort of the autistic spectrum somewhere or something. But like if somebody says to me they don't like something, they're right, I really like. I'm like, how is that even possible? <laughs> like, you know, I really I find it hard to sort of pray. Like if I think. Well, you know, like, oh, that's one thing I was going to mention when she covered up her uh, brands there, that, like, and that's nothing there as well. It seemed funny in the credits, they're um, nearly all the songs, like, classical music, like, something in E minor, and, you know, it's like, you don't see that very often in films. But, um, yeah, when she covered him up, I was thought, well, that's just asking for trouble. Um, uh, yeah, but, um, yeah, years and years worth of money you could have lost out on by making one of these killer dummy movies, but... I can't remember if it's on the Fats and Friends one. Yeah, I think it must be. But somebody mentioned, uh, oh, what's his name? I can't remember the actor's name, but the film is called The Great Gabba, a film from the twenties, and it's on YouTube and it's like I think it's on IMDb as well, like copyright free and stuff. And uh, I watched it. Oh, and it is brilliant. And that's what I was saying about these kind of movies. It's it's really funny because obviously a film from the 20s you're going to say you know things have slightly changed but the subject matter 
the way it was presented like the characters didn't feel like you know when you see people from the 20s and there was a little bit of this like um, uh, good day sir I, I'm not going to be like this and uh, you know, great to show you've ever seen and all that like kind of really sort of cliched sort of uh, that reminded me of the remake of Elm Street funny enough that little shot there of the walking down this um, this uh, corridor I like how the candles as well that's kind of a cool touch and that that, that reminded me of them dead straight away and like text chains and mask the the, uh, the animals heads on the wall which is a real weird uh, posh burst and thing what they do yeah, that painting there, I've just finished on my drink. Uh, that painting seems a little bit, you can tell it's like new. Maybe it's new. Uh, yeah, but this uh, great Gabo was um, the way the guy was like treating this woman like crap. Then the woman like left him because she was like, I'm not being, you know, treated like crap like this. And then the guy was like really sort of missing this woman and things like that. And it felt modern. It was really it's a really ridiculous thing to say, you know, when you talk about like a film that's so old. But just the way it, it used music a lot, there was like a lot of musical numbers in it set in vaudeville and things like that. And he got this ventriloquist dummy where he got like a um, like like a ball connected with a cable that when he squeezed it the doll's mouth like opened and closed and the doll could like move its arms and legs and things like he was controlling and stuff and he was like using this he was taking this doll sort of like he'd go to the restaurant with this doll and stuff uh, dummy I should say actually that's kind of a Freudian slip there because uh, one thing on this um Facts and Friends documentary that's on Magic, the main guy that's presented it says, in England they call them dolls, which drive me nuts. And I'm thinking, nobody calls them dolls. Maybe they do. Uh, 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 there's, so, there's so many things you can call. But yeah, he takes, in this great Gabo, he takes um, Otto, the dummy's name is, he takes him out like to restaurants and pretends he's talking to him for like generate publicity. And I thought it was quite like, as if you could imagine like a modern ventriloquist doing that like kind of thing here. He'd sort of, um, you know, that, but that's another thing though as well, like saying you know, this stuff is just kind of like everywhere. But um, my dad likes getting this place called Blackpool, it's like a huge tourist place in the UK. Or oh, well, it kind of used to be, kind of still is a little bit. But we went in this like, you know, really traditional work. You went to Club Medaco's all the time. And we went, a lot of the last times we went, they had a venture, I, he, I think it was on a little bit later and we were going to be there, so I kind of missed it, but they were having a ventriloquist on, it was just little things like those, like, ooh, ventriloquist, <laughs> you yeah. know. Um, but yeah, in this great Gabo, it was really, really well put together, I, I think it, I could uh, put the link down below. Uh, that was a oh, harpsichord, I love the sound of a harpsichord. I really do. There's something uh, like the, um, like you know, you think a lot of classical music playing on a piano, but um, when you see it just played, that's a good show. There's some really, and this is another thing though as well, where I think there's like, you know, it's a bit like how Night of the Living Dead was really, really influential and things like that. But there's this real modern phenomenon of like, um, if, you, if you're gonna make a low budget movie, it's nearly always like a horror or a slasher. But I don't know if it is just digital filmmaking has reduced the cost of things so much. But like now, like you see quite a few like killer dummy movies or you see a ton of westerns where that was always, I even remember Romero saying, oh, making a western was out because we couldn't afford like the horses kind of thing. And I remember like Ed Wood was making a western but he had to abandon it because he like couldn't afford to finish it and things. Uh, but like now you see a ton of westerns, like they're everywhere. And then, then the gates there reminded me of um, uh, the Texas Chainsaw 3D, which Daniel Pearl did so have nothing to do with. Uh, but like their little things like their... Uh, and the twist in this movie, what is real, and that's another thing though as well, because again, quote, quote, nowadays, um, we don't have one hour a lot, but like because of like the internet and because you do see so many trailers and people talking about movies all the time, that the twists for movies, how they get spoiled outright or you can sort of kind of figure them out a little bit. 
but when I went went to watch Ten Cloverfield Lane, I was really genuinely surprised because it was what I was expecting. And it wasn't what I was expecting because I didn't know much about it. It was like, oh, cool, cool. And even more so with this, like when it gets to the twist ending, I was like, oh my. A lot of, yeah, spoilers by the way, because I might accidentally give anybody who's listening to this before they've seen the film. But um, when it gets to the point where just before the reveal, I could not. I honestly, if you'd have paused it there and, and told me wait half an hour before, I've been like, what, what, what? I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And I think with these kind of movies, though, this is probably. There are only downside, and that's probably too strong a phrase, really. But a bit like with Friday the Thirteenth, there's only a couple of really ways you can do it. For the most part, you, Jason's either got to be a guy who's really hard to kill, or a zombie. And some people like one version, some people don't like the other. And it's a bit like with these killer dummy movies. Don't you do some really weird esoteric idea where it's set inside a computer or something that like you basically the dummies either got to be possessed and really walking around or the dummies either got to be somebody else controlling it or it's just somebody pretending or somebody's gone insane or something which both schools of thought have got like a lot of um you know a lot of possibility in there. there's a lot of stuff you can do with those two scenarios she have a fine but for the most part uh they're the only really you know, but the basic broad strokes of the story, they're the only two ways you can really go. And when this film did do the twist, not the Chubby Jack song, uh, but when it sort of, if she drinks dread wine, dread wine, when she drinks red, dread, there's, no, there's a horror movie wine that could exist. When she drinks red wine in her pants, people say, ooh, that's, we'll film that. <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, possibility in those two those two methods but at the same time it's like you know you go oh I'm okay you know I kind of saw it coming one second oh yeah that was another thing as well I've got in my uh, list of quotes was um, there's a British talk show where I've not seen him on doing the talk show for a little bit he does um, shows about like dogs because he's a big animal lover and things uh, like dogs and cats and things uh, but his name Paul O'Grady and I remember him once he had like a tea time talk show and I used to watch it every night but I mean, sometimes I just flick it on or whatever just flick it through the channels if it was on and I remember it distinctly I'm, pa I'm paraphrasing the quote but this is almost verbatim what he said <laughs> that's an oxymoron but he said um, he's done loads of these like variety shows Fordville type shows over the years because he was like he was about 50, 60 or something so he's, he's, he's been in the business for quite a long time and he said, almost without fail, and obviously again, he might have been being a bit facetious, but this is what he basically what he said, is that all ventriloquists are crazy. And I kind of love that in a lot of ways, that, you know, don't get me wrong, if you know the killer bus full of nuns, I guess, you know what you're going to do with that. But the reveal what happens to that dress is great. That's one of those proper sort of, I think there's certain kind of things that like I think I'm pretty desensitised and most stuff doesn't really affect me or offend me but it's like oh that's brilliant it was just one of those things that, oh that's brilliant like you know it's just like a real proper like pervy thing like you know and it was like yeah but that's another thing though as well where and even though like this is something I've only sort of thought about more recently is that say again talking about like production design and things like that but even though like you know if I have a shave once a month, you know, it's kind of like a minor miracle. But it must really annoy women when, like, she, she's got out of the shower. And from a production standpoint, you can tell she's got, like, makeup on and her hair is kind of done. <laughs> you know, they've just slightly... They've combed it and then messed it up a little bit. You know, and I think that's, like... But, and this is one of those things as well where... And I hate myself for saying this, I really do, because it's kind of like... Just checking, we're still recording. Uh, but yeah, this is one of those things where I hated myself for saying this the first time I watched it. Was that like, 
what is she doing? That like, I it always used to really, really annoy me when like I'd watch films with like seeing my parents or somebody who didn't like horror films that much. Like I distinctly remember my sister saying once when I was watching um, Friday the 13th Part 8 because it was one of the very first horror films I rented down and watched it around my sister's house. And I think she'd gone shopping and then she came back and she and there was they just got to the bit where they came they come back to shore and they get to New York and stuff. And one of them says, let's split up. And I just didn't remember my sister saying, that's really stupid. And it's a bit like, though, with this, it's like, you know, don't get me wrong, I know sometimes if if you freaked out or if you're not thinking straight, you don't do stuff you normally would do. But how many women would get out of the shower and go into an attic or just with a towel around them? And I saw a tweet the other day, funny enough, and even though I don't believe in ghosts anymore, this tweet really resonated with me. It said, um, in the daytime, I don't believe in ghosts, but at night time, I'm a lot more open-minded. And I did think that was kind of funny, actually, that, like... Because even, I think, like, like I said before, with things like that, that, like, again, I, I don't think, like... You know, I don't mind walking around late at night on my own if I'm walking back from the cinema or a pub or something. Or if you said to me, walk somewhere at four o'clock in the morning, I'd be okay, it wouldn't bother me at all. But just every so often, I'll see something. Or like when there's a shot of the the mother looking out the window. I've said a million times that that always freaks me out. And it's like little things like that there. It is funny, and I think like you know, if if you do, I guess it's a sign of a good horror movie. But if you do put yourself in their shoes, that sort of, you know, you think like, God, I imagine being stuck in an attic like overnight, or even just for an hour or something. Like, oh. And that's another thing though as well. Uh, I thought like, how many films have got like a main character named Malcolm? And I did think this is interesting because uh, there's certain names like my name Dave has become like a common like when I was a kid growing up and you get like David Hasselhoff and I and I still think David Hasselhoff is dead cool but you get David Hasselhoff or David Soul or certainly these people that were huge mega stars and things and I used to think David was like a quiet I always used to think to myself oh at least with the name David I didn't get named Pomfleur or something or you know I didn't have like five Z's in my name or something you know which would actually be kind of awesome to be, to be honest but I always thought I locked out really by having a really ordinary name but now like there's a TV channel in the UK called Dave there's like the LED joke oh we make Dave and Dave, oh, Dave and it's become like a really stupid name <laughs> like like almost overnight but like Malcolm and like the certain names like Malcolm or Colin that always seem like they're like really geeky names uh, and things like that. But it's kind of cool to see a film with like somebody named Malcolm in it, like, you know, and he was like, he was like a quite a suave looking handsome guy, you know, so it's like, oh, it's pretty. And then I was thinking about it, like, you know, talking about like, like remakes and things and things like that, like, you know, the Elm Street remake and stuff. But you think like Malcolm McDowell, he's like this really sort of, you know, he's like Clockwork Orange with Kubrick and things like that. And his name Malcolm, you know, it's like that. That shot there, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if I, I think I've missed it both times. Though I don't see. I didn't see what freak trip me. Was it? Was it Brahms? Oh, minions! The sunlight's just coming through the windows, like it is. Like it is here. So this is like this is like virtual reality. So let's actually take a picture of that first, first picture of the country. I was actually quite chuffed. I got a tweet favoured last night by Paul Feig and one by Ralph Garman. About that, just thought I'd look at my phone. What's that? That's one thing as well. I think I might have said something to exchange some my commentary. I'm not sure, but one thing I think if you can get it just right and it's really easier said than done. But if you can, if you can, if you can, I was just a, I saw a huge seagull out of the window. <laughs> uh, 
don't know why that was funny to me. But yeah, if you can get the conditions of watching a movie, like there, that photograph looks quite good in a way. Like, you know, you can tell it's just probably a photograph of that woman when she was younger and stuff, and the guy when he was a little bit younger, and they've just photoshopped it. And he said cobble. They've photoshopped it together, and yeah. But um, yeah, if you can get the conditions just right of watching a movie like there, like the sun just coming up, just the sun's coming up in real life. It's like, ooh, uh, and like we're texting into a massacre. I tried to make it so that like, I don't know if I did it on purpose or not, but the sun was just setting as the sun was setting in the movie and it was like, oh. But yeah, but this is another thing though as well. Like when they, when Malcolm comes back in and he, he pulls the cord on the stairs and the steps go up and it kind of just made me laugh like that. Like again, I, like I found myself, I hated myself for saying it, but in these kind of films, um, to rationalise as the dummy moving or is the dummy not moving that like oh look how quick look how easy the steps go back up so it was like maybe it was you <laughs> you know and I, I kind of love that but that was one thing I thought they proper nailed it like was um, and that probably why I'll be a rubbish filmmaker or why uh, some of the stuff on this channel if I have when my input goes into it that, uh, it's not the best sometimes but I'd have to have a shot of like oh you know his eyes moving or something like you know uh, that'd be a prop and there's be a hardcore hardcore trivia question that like do you find um but um 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 uh, yeah when people say oh can you name the magnificent seven or can you name the seventh samurai those ten rules for looking after Brahms now, that'd be a, I tell you what if you can remember I've only seen the film once but if you can if you remember them sorry about that would be a proper spot on a uh, movie trivia quiz And, uh, oh, and that was nothing though as well. I was just going to say they look like they look do. Uh, that was wrong with me. I mean, what's wrong with me? Oh, so, an F just crept in. Uh, uh, but they just look like quite normal people to be fair, because they're in the two movie stars and the two quite good looking movie stars as well. But that was nothing as well because I'm so used to seeing pool in movies, the game pool or billiards or whatever it's called. But it seemed funny seeing snooker. I think this is like the second. Hollywood movie that's had pool and it's up snooker and I was thinking about this the other day but which one came first and this has probably happened a couple of times but like say with baseball and rounders and snooker and pool but whichever one of those came first I know sometimes it's you know it's six of one after us doing the other and it could be a, a case of literally weeks you know separating the two but I always think if you saw pool and then invented snooker or you saw snooker and then invented pool the pure audacity of it that just go yeah, change the colour of the balls <laughs> and you have to pot them in a different way is there any other difference? nah and it's like with baseball and rounders I kind of always look cause in this country I don't know what it's like in other countries but we always had this thing it's, you know, even to this day I've never still watched a full game of baseball I've played a lot of baseball computer games and stuff and I quite like baseball I was wish they'd done the baseball plans of the apes and the, the Tim Burton one where it was meant to land in a baseball stadium full of apes which is like a war small there but but a lot of times I haven't seen it for a long time to be fair but in the UK if you ever saw, saw baseball or anybody ever mentioned baseball you could almost guarantee without fail somebody would always say oh it's just bloody rounders it's not you know like and I distinctly remember going RBI baseball for the Amiga and it makes me laugh even to this day the instructions so we're saying oh uh, rounders and baseball and nothing the likes and it was like you know, it was a British game was sticking up for you know baseball and saying like oh people pitch baseballs at 100 miles an hour and you know, the stadiums are full of people and the stars get paid millions and then it said oh maybe it is the same but either way if you think somebody somewhere along the line that pretty much the only real distinct difference as far as I can remember playing rounders at school was the bat was a bit smaller and it's like that's it I feel like that's in Wayne's world when they talk about the difference between Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man and even though that's wrong when he says he's got a bow in her hair that like I can't help but thinking that was the same with like rounders it was like you know all oh, rounders and baseball you know it's like well yeah they are the same but yeah that, you know <laughs> what's wrong with that 
I almost feel I can't remember if this was written by a, a man or a woman or not but there's certain shots in this or there's certain shots in especially horror movies but just films generally where like again where I think oh I'd probably be a rubbish writer where like um, what do women do it's on the phone in movie magazines I don't, I don't know <laughs> And it's like there, like I said before, that like, like I know I said it earlier on, but like I do, it just, just, I do find it funny. I just put, sometimes picture somebody like in the twenties watching this game. Oh, what's that phone? What's that wire coming out of that phone? <laughs> yeah, I've done a kind of a quasi little short list of. Um, uh, ventriloquist, ventriloquist movies, uh, The Great Gabo, Dead of Night is a really, really cool movie. It was um, by Alien, who were mostly known for comedies. But it's a really good British horror movie. It's an anthology movie. It's like five stories. And, and one of them is a ventriloquist dummy movie. But it's got a great basis for all these characters being in the same house. And it's got a really cool concept. That's the best way of phrasing it without giving it away. It's just a really, I like that. The, it's only a dream. I'm such a, a lot of people like that. Where she just thought it was only a day. That's not the concept in <laughs> Dead of Night, by the way. But it's a great concept. There's another film called um, Making Contact. I haven't watched it yet, but it's on YouTube. I think it's called Joey as well. Uh, this is another one I haven't seen yet. Is a uh, night of the, I thought I was made a mistake. It's just a bit of fluff on the one. Uh, uh, night of the Living Dummy, um, and it's based on the uh, novels uh, is E. L. Stein, um, who wrote Goosebumps, and apparently according to the trivia on Magic, the dummy in Night Living Dummy talks like bats from. Um, what's happened, Linda? You are. Did you like ventriloquist dummies? Why do you, they make that noise when they're stroking? Mindy, mindy, mindy. And there's the Goosebumps film that was funny when I was talking to Stu and he said he'd seen it. And uh, the reason he's seen it because he's got like a uh, pass, he goes the end of them. But I said, Is there a ventriloquist dummy? And then he says, Yeah, and he said he thought to be straight away, like, you know, because he was like, Kill us, that's what I think he says. <laughs> uh, uh, there was the episode of Andrew Tribeca, there was uh, Mrs. Columbo, Victoria, so what's that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight things, there's uh, Dead Silence, which is a great, um, quote unquote, modern horror movie. It's from the director of Saw. And that's another thing as well, when I was saying about how these um, films have influenced different things, like how Jigsaw uses that Billy Dummy is like a, he's like cover or like to freak people out in to all intents and purposes it's basically a killer dummy people would think of that as i think most people probably think of that as some kind of like possessed puppet or something that even though it isn't it kind of is and then how it was parodied in like scary movie four and things like that that oh and i'm just looking at devil doll as well and that was not a british film but i think it, it might actually be, be a british film so yeah i mean there's probably a good at least 15, 20, and then like I say, with some of these things being TV shows, with some of these things being like, I say Night Living Dummy, excuse me, I think there's at least two books, there's at least two films, or well, there's at least a film, there's two books and there's a film, and then there's the Goosebumps film. So there's this thing like, say, how it just, just filters through, it just goes through all the, that, that, that shot there really freaked me out where you can see something behind the door like that, that was like, Ooh! I lost a little bit of cold coffee. <laughs> a painting that I was really, really cool that was in the moment of madness painted on the wall there. I think the paintings were actually credited in the. Which is fair enough because it's, that's quite an elaborate thing. I thought I was quite dimmer switches. Yeah, that was another thing as well. I like that, that framing of that shot there. Oh, he made a sandwich. <laughs> that's a great. That, I thought that as well. That's a brilliant, like little certain little things in horror movies and 
I know we like say uh, we think about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because of Daniel Pearl, but like when I said on the uh, Leatherface, when I said on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre commentary about Leatherface wearing a bow tie, wearing a bow tie, I'm uh, thinking of it, that's really that's in there. Um, Leatherface wearing a tie is a genius thing and ventriloquist always speaking of which always nearly always wearing a bow tie is a great idea but um but that's just a great little scene there of like yeah it's all intents and purposes you think oh a ventriloquist always made a sandwich oh brilliant when you think about acting though it really is like a bizarro thing in a way that like you know you you it's you know, glorified pretending in a lot of ways, you know. I don't get wrong, I've really belittled the art of acting there. Yeah, but just looking at my notes there that like um like when I was growing up there was like a load of ventriloquists knocking around. There's a there's a guy named Roger de Corsi and he had this bear named Nuki Bear and he was like oh a bit rude. And then there was a guy named Keith Harris and he had a green duck named Orville, which is quite crazy. And he had um a monkey named Bubbles. What's Bubbles? I think it was Bubbles there. Yeah. Ain't that duck, he used to say. Uh, but he had a number one single in the UK called Because This Duck Couldn't Fly. And the, the giant seagull on the roof. It's like, yeah, I feel like it's a Pixar movie. Um, but, um, yeah, so he had a number one song like when I was a kid. And I think I've, even my type, so I used to have it anyway, uh, the song on, on vinyl. But I didn't, again, when I was saying about this thing, and especially, like, say, growing up in the 70s and 80s, but that's another thing as well. If you watch Magic, like, now, I think ventriloquism's got this weird, like, ooh, ventriloquism's stupid, or it's a bit, like, you know, it's like you can't get, like, a successful ventriloquism act. But if you watch, like, Magic, and, and obviously it's a, a fictional story, it's just scripted, but the the pretty stamps there as well. But the main sort of um, thing about magic is always a X-rated ventriloquist, and he'll, he's going to be popular on TV and stuff. But watching when I was on YouTube, and I just typed in ventriloquism, and I think it was like in on oh, Britain's Got Talent or you know, Australia's Got Talent or one of these Got Talent shows. Somebody who won was a ventriloquist in. There's a ventriloquist in the UK named Nina Conti and she's been quite popular recently. And again, when I'm saying this, this really, I really do find, I've probably said it about a hundred times already, but do genuinely find it interesting that like, it's just always there. It's like the force. <laughs> That's another thing though as well. I only found out this recently. Check, I'm still recording. The, um, there's this thing called the Uncanny Valley. And I think this is what, once you know this, I think it kind of, not takes away the scariness of ventriloquist dummies, but I think it makes you process it a little bit better. Kind of pun intended. But a, I think it was a TED lecture or a Vsauce lecture, I'm not sure. Uh, lecture was probably about five minutes, but um, also that was a weird phrase about going for a lecture because you think of oh, a lecture and some of them are quite good, uh, but yeah, this thing called Uncanny Valley where it's saying that if you see like a mannequin or if you see like a waxwork figure or a painting because it kind of looks real, but there's no real textures or there's no real stuff behind the eyes you can't kind of look at it like it's a real person but because there's no real response or the mouth doesn't move in the right way it doesn't move at all or if the eyes move in a real mechanical way you look at it like it's a person but because it's freaking your brain out that's what i think freaks you out about like ventriloquist dummies and i was looking at some pictures online of some ventriloquist dummies and some of them are so you think is that just a guy in like weird makeup? They go, oh no, it's a ventriloquist puppet. <laughs> but another thing as well, that if you can get hold of the Magic DVD, I say there's a great documentary about ventriloquism. But there's a bit, uh, kiss good night, is his rule ten. <laughs> um, but it's a great thing on that documentary, and again, it's always stuck with me. 
what they were saying to learn any skill really really well is you've got to practice it for at least a thousand hours and even though I've always been a big fan of like not just the film magic but the actual concept and you know, people can do like card tricks and uh, you know when they you know slides of hand and all this kind of stuff that like I've seen a load of people now that can watch like a magic trick and just go yeah like it's, and then you, you think about it took somebody a thousand hours to learn a really complicated magic trick or when you see like a ventriloquist do something and especially I know it's like the real big cliches of like drinking a glass of water at the same time or you know smoking a cigarette or something the one doing the gestures when it's audio for like it's radio hands <laughs> yeah put the gun away I'm not a method actor. Uh, but yeah that um, yeah that's sort of one of these things where it's like I think it's ever such a shame that and like when I was saying earlier on that like especially nowadays when there's so many people who who were into say learn, learning the guitar or say you know being a half decent fast typist or you know they might be quite you know quote unquote mundane things in a lot of ways you know just learning how I don't know drive a car or something and what, do people just like go yeah as if it's like you know, they, you know see somebody can drive a car really well or park a car really well and just be like yeah as if it's like something you just flick a switch and it happens you know kind of thing the I five rolls. She's peeling a pear. What's really funny though as well, because she, I know most begin old, and you go, "Well, those tomatoes look nice." <laughs> those tomatoes. Uh, this is one thing as well. I thought, again, I kind of hate myself for saying it, but I thought it was a valid point that, like, oh, this Malcolm can never get in. It seems like, but you think, well. If he's delivering, delivering the goods, there's some good song him. But if he's delivering all this produce for him, what's the produce? If he's delivering all this stuff for him, week after week after week, day after day after day, why not just give him a key? <laughs> do, you, do you have fine women in jeans and cardigans? Attractive. He's got a little crown on his cardigan. And that's another thing though as well, to bit like production design is. I think that sort of for getting that dummy just right, and I think to me that dummy is freakier and scarier than say the more modern interpretations of say Chucky from Child's Play. Because I think when you see Chucky in the first couple of Child's Play movies and he's just like a good guy doll and he's not like, he ain't like falling apart, you know, like stitching himself together. And again, Leatherface is another good example, or maybe, maybe even Jason and Freddy to a degree. But I think sometimes there's a bit of a trend to sort of, ooh, make it as freaky as possible and make it all distressed and make it look like, you know, it's been set on fire or something. And sometimes when you look at the original Halloween, we can't believe can you leave John Carpenter's returning to make a um, Halloween film or produce a Halloween film, I should say, maybe score it, hopefully, and you know, you never know, maybe a bit more if we're lucky. <laughs> Touch wood. Uh, but yeah, that I think you know, I know it's a cliche to see, but like less is more kind of thing. But, um, but like with Brahms, there that like you know, he's got like you know, a nice little shirt on and stuff and, you know, he's, he hasn't got no, like, markings on his face or anything um, and he's got, like, a nice little haircut and that and I think that really works because I, I really do think that, like, even as much as I love that, The Great Gabbo, I thought there was one part where it, it, it was on the wrong side of, like, it looked, quote-unquote, normal and then it was, like, oh, okay, you know, and... And that's nothing though as well about these killer dummy movies is that even if the dummy isn't the one doing the killing, there's something kind of like dead and demon. Like it's so weird that like like say and it's like I heard somebody say on, on IMDb all oh, this film starts slow, but that's these films real strength is the if you just said straight away, oh um I'm mad me or oh, oh this doll's really alive. The 
it would completely ruin him. It would just be like, you know, it's like such a be you know, you could say like most films are kind of pointless anyway, but if at the start of this film they just said what it was, you know, you'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> but when you do know what the twist is in this film, it's kind of strange in a way because it's kind of like, you could see why those people would stick around but then they were basically looking after him anyway really so it's kind of like a proper MacGuffin that like you know why do you need to have this fake doll there and you know but it's good yeah because like that it, it like I said, it's like a good magic trick there yeah once you've seen the trick or once you know the trick works you go it, it does take that mysticism out of it a little bit but then again like I said you could see that bit almost anything I mean like I said about like say learning the guitar I do think it's incredible though because like, I've been learning the guitar recently and years and years ago when I've had a guitar and before I had like electronic tuner and stuff I could barely tune one and you know I had like you know relatively cheap guitars and you know I'd, I'd, and I'd, I gave up after like two weeks and stuff but it's amazing though, like since the internet you can pull off all these tutorials and you've got electronic tuners so you can just tune it straight away. Still still kind of hard in some ways though, because it's like, why is it a little bit sharp when it should be, when it, oh no, it's gone flat. Uh, but like, it's, it's amazing, like, and that's another thing though, and I've got this, like I say, I've said it about 10 times on this commentary already, but like, oh in my day, and I feel like that. Sometimes I come across like a massive Luddite, but in some ways I wouldn't have it any other way how things are now like occasionally i'll think oh, i wish we had video shops or i know it's probably still there one knocking around i think there is still even blockbusters still knocking around uh, like there's about two in america or something like that but uh, like say a guitar is an amazing example where when i think when i first started to try and learn the guitar in the 90s and other people have learned the guitar way earlier than that and way better than i did but I felt like it was really difficult and it still is, don't get me wrong, you know, at the end of the day it's like um, but since like the internet and say since things like electronic tuners and since things like you know, loads of information just out there everywhere I feel like and I've been like an half decent guitar it's made learning a thousand times easier like, you know, exponentially so and I think it's one of those things where that's something like I really do think doesn't get nowhere near enough credit and I was going to make another point and I can't think what it was oh that's one thing about yeah I'll say it just I'll, I'll put it out there just in case anybody knows the answer but I was thinking about the electric guitar the other day or just guitars generally but when you think that like learning the chords is you know putting your fingers on different strings on different frets and you think okay that's fine but who in the hell came up with the concept of a guitar or a, you know, a bass has got four strings, a guitar's got six, you know, for the most part. And you've got seven string, eight string guitars and six string basses and four string basses, five string basses and all these things. But, you know, just say for argument's sake, a six string guitar. Somebody came up with six strings on the guitar, 22 frets. And then, if you put like a finger on, you know, the E string, and then a finger on the B string, and then if it, that's that cool, and then a finger on that string, and a finger on like how ridiculously complicated that it's not just a case of you put one finger on one fret, and you that can be a note, like, you know, it's like if you put your finger on the top E string, you know, the low E string, and uh, the, the top fret near the knot is an F, and you think, okay, but then you go. You know, and then but if you want to play like a C or something, it's completely you know a, a, a C chord. It's like this weird combination of fingering, huh? And then so it's this like kind of thing of, and I'm terrible stuff like this. Like I want to get these weird esoteric thoughts. I'm like, oh, I didn't do that. But it really was like a mind blow to me that like some of this, and I think that's another thing though that like again talking about things that I think amazing what people take for granted but a guitar is a perfect example of this going on, going on a massive tangent now but if you think about a guitar how many people see when you play a guitar and especially an electric guitar to in this analogy 
uh, you'll see a guitar and think, yeah, a guitar, great. And uh, and you think a guitar is a tree that somebody's grown somewhere. So, you know, the trees probably took 10 years to grow. And then you've got to have a certain kind of wood. It's especially funny as I'm watching uh, two people uh, 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 in, uh, in bed. Uh, you've got to have a certain kind of wood and then you've got to combine the neck piece of the wood to the body part of the, the guitar and then you've got to have like the uh, headstock and then you join all those things together and then you need like the frets and then you need the strings and then if you've got like a trem arm or a flute, Floyd Rose trem that, that's really I thought the cup was going to do a lot of that that's really really complicated and then you've got like the electronics for like the input and the tone and the volume and if you've got like certain amount of pickups you've got like a selector switch in and all these different things like that and it's just this and then the pickups are this are its own thing and it's in and of itself and then you it's got to be painted and varnished and lacquered and all these different kind of things and then and then like I say when I'm saying about like just how ridiculously complicated they are that like say you've got these six strings and all these frets and all these weird combinations that make up all these notes and all these chords and you can have all these uh, Octaves and arpeggios and all these different, you know, you harmonics and artificial pinch harmonics, and and then and then sometimes as well, like, like you say when you get like seven seven strings on the guitar, and and you can you can tune the seventh string to anything you want, or the cashmere tuning is E guard, and you're like, why can't you do oh, what? <laughs> and another really good example of this as well is like arcade machines, like I grew up with arcade machines, I even talked to the guy who owned my local chip shop in my street the other day and sort of like I used to go in there I'll play on the arcade machine all the time but when you look at like if you can see even like a really traditional or just any arcade machine for that matter and you see an arcade machine and you think it's just an arcade machine but you think for the most part the wood or a lot of the older ones are wood uh, a wood. I thought uh, I thought they were doing everything. So the spook is like, oh. but when you see a lot of um, arcade machines a lot of wood and then they've got like a TV sort of monitor inside and then they've got like a PCB board with the game on then they've got like joysticks then like loads of wires then they've got the light for the marquee and, and it suddenly becomes this thing that you think ah it's just a piece of wood with Italian and to this like really complex really bizarre weird thing it's like oh my god Problems is listening. I always think it's quite funny as well because I saw on IMDb the kid who played Brahms in the photograph. I always think it's quite funny though that like sometimes when you see the kid that played uh, Damien in the original Omen film and he was in the Omen the Omen remake. And it's just like it's dead funny when you see these people that like, if it's and even like not even child actors but even say actors that you haven't seen for a long time. But especially so if it's like say, to be fair, like people like Corey Feldman have aged quite well. But it's dead funny that sometimes when you see him twenty years later, and like I just when I was going through the cast on IMDb and I saw this kid who played like say Brahms in the photograph, and I just thought if he's at convention twenty years from now, he's just like a fat guy. <laughs> The best one ever is um, Joshua from War Games, though, because I've always got such a soft spot for War Games and, you know, shall we play a game and all that. And then I saw, I think he's like a TV producer now, and he literally is just a bloke. It's so funny. It's not like, you know, like, you know, like, say, it's like Corey Feldman is like, you know, he's still like, it almost looks like what he did, like, you know, Lost Boys or something. And this guy, I never would have clocked him as the guy from War Games, you know. But I always think that must be a really disheartening thing in a way that like even if you're an adult and no wonder child stars get really messed up because imagine if somebody says to this kid, Yeah, you like a kid that could be a possessed ventriloquist dummy who's like a real psycho <laughs> I mean they probably did say that too and they were just like look into the distance and act act a bit weird <laughs> but it's still like a really uh, 
Oh, that's always a funny thing that like I always think that like that's a good that's a great shot. Just reminds me of um, the curse on Mike the curse of Michael Myers poster, which might be deliberate. I'm not sure. And little things like that as well. That that's what I think is quite funny is that like I'm just wondering which battery over there. I think it should be okay. But um, yeah, in certain horror films where they try and sort of oh let's do something crazy like you know, saw somebody's head off or something or you know. You know, put somebody on like a, you know like a circular saw table and saw them in half or something and go really crazy. But they're like their issues just tempting all the rats out of the uh, traps. That like I said, I don't know why why that was such a big thing. Is that like a McGuffin as well? Maybe. Because why, why is that? Because like you say, you don't let brams go outside and you know that's uh, maybe all the rules are just completely like meaningless. I'm sure that that looks dead like the walkway from. The Elm Street remake. Frank! <laughs> this proper reminded me of Short Circuit 2 where um, Stephanie's idiot boyfriend tries to go get number five back and there's a, a shot of him playing pool in, in like a dive bar and then when he goes to like Stephanie's house and it kind of reminded me of like an, an amalgamation of those two scenes but then again I think Short Circuit has influenced like every other th every third film or something. <laughs> I feel like now she should say to him, tell him uh, what you're going to do with this dummy. Well, I think we've far enough into this commentary now to talk major spoilers, but I'll just uh, do a quick countdown just in case. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. But when, um, when Brams gets broke, I mean, I did not see that coming. I mean, I, I even though I've watched a million films and done like about 100 commentaries and things like that, that like uh, you know and you know even did a bit of film studies at college and stuff I never I mean I'm terrible for predicting stuff like that but it just completely caught me off guard and that was nothing as well I don't know when this started coming into the parlance of American movies but seeing people I know this is meant to be set in the UK but seeing people drink pints is so you know it's so funny because I just associate a pint of lager with like it's such a UK thing and then like you know it's like I don't really watch that much of the Big Bang Theory anymore in a lot of ways. But um, when they started drinking, drinking, when they started drinking uh, Newcastle Brown Ale and that, I was like, what? <sighs> I can't remember what's on that. I don't know, was it like a jack or something? That's the thing I thought was quite good about this as well, because um, I think, does she go back and, I think she, does she go back and rescue him and then does she have to get saved, which could be a bit, you know, I mean, you're kicking it into this, I suppose. Oh. <laughs> and that's the thing I love about these Ventral Crystal movies, like there, how Brams is just sitting by the table, and it's just such like a brilliant sort of. Um, oh, well, I read some of it on IMDb. I don't like just reading the trivia off IMDb because you know anybody can do that. But um, I should imagine it's true. But it, it's such a great concept either way. But they said the cast were trying to freak each other out by leaving Brams in weird places, and eventually he got smashed because somebody got that freaked out by him. This is a nice little tribute to well, not a tribute, but a nice like, parallel to magic because Anthony. Uh, Anthony Perkins was going for his life. Anthony Hopkins was going to throw uh, his dummy out the window if somebody had to come get him because he was freaked out by it. But um, I love the thought of him actually destroying Brams on the actual set as well. Like, he could do that freaked out. Well, I hope that used to shame if they broke him because he's a cool prop. But that's another thing as well. I think I'd probably be a good ventriloquist for because even if I've got like the few little puppets or little teddy bears that I have got. I can't leave them just like face down or like just throw them somewhere. So I think, oh, you know, that's not very nice. <laughs> and that's another thing there as well. And that's a perfect shot there to describe Bram, Bram sitting in that chair. But a really good cinema cinematographer or a really good lighting guy. So there's this puzzle on the, on, on the uh, box there. But, um, I think a lot of people know when they light stuff, they light scenes really well, 
I mean, I don't on a technical level, the game Chester, but just the the really brightly lit scenes, like there's no light and dark and shadow and things. But that's one thing I think are really good, and I think it's a proper sign of a good cinematographer is our scene has got like some scenes where some parts of the scene where you can't see much and stuff's in shadow or stuff's in silhouette or and it is and even though you can see three or four lights there they aren't the lights lighting the scene but it really does feel like it and i think that's a you know again some just people look at that and go yeah they're the lights lighting the scene you know it's like okay and even now to this day i still almost don't understand how the light in total darkness because you kind of defeat it, not, not, obviously not total darkness, but when a scene is really dark and there's sort of, you know, there's not a lot of obvious light in the scene, but you can sort of tell what's going on. Like, it's like, how to do that? Jeff, that, that man attractive. <laughs> But this is what's really funny as well because when it got to these scenes and this is like where again i read there was um, two endings apparently there's an ending where they destroy brahms there's an ending where she stays with brahms but um again that's that's where the fun of these movies does start because like i said before there's but in my mind anyway i mean if i was writing one of these movies there if somebody said, you know, play it relatively straight, you know, that sort of, you know, don't have it suddenly, it's in the Matrix or something, you know, that like, I feel like that, you know, there's only like them two ways of doing it, like I said before, but at the same time, that even if it did turn out that this was all a big con, if she suddenly went along with it like, or, you know, if it did turn out the doll was possessed, she really just did, you know, really want to look after the doll and things like that and I, th I think that is a you know I think that's like do I keep saying doll because maybe British people do say doll that's terrible And even that's like a really sort of neat touch though, the way that like those dead rats in that bag and stuff. <laughs> Get out of my house. Well, it's funny, I saw a funny trailer for The Conjuring the other day where, um, where I very first heard of EVPs. The, that was one of the last times I got proper freaked out. You were like, ah! But uh, on this trailer for The Conjuring, there was just a guy playing like an audio tape on what's one of them. And, um, it was like it sounded like a proper like Yorkshire working men's class like he had been down the pit or something like that and what the kind of voice that was but it was it was uh, basically like that and then they, they stopped the tape and they said oh did anything sound funny about the audio on that tape and they were like well sort of but not really and they were like it's actually a ten year old girl and it was like uh, but little things like that, like that, that get out of my house kind of thing, like that's like, again, it's one of those great, like, you know, Amateurville type, you know, sort of real sort of, you know, cornerstones of horror. The clocks always seem like on interesting times. What's really funny though is what's amazing was just the eye spinning around there. Uh, but what's amazing about that scene though is because I honestly think in the last like, 10 years in horror that is just unbelievable. Because like I say, I just 
did not see. and this part is is amazing just these these few seconds here i've got to admit like say because you know you you know you think for the most part you've seen it all before and you know you know once you start to get in you know your 20s 30s you think oh i've seen a billion horror films and you know i can't get freaked out and i'm like a cocky way i just think like you know for the most part especially a lot of quote unquote mainstream horror movies you know, you know, in some cases it might be a little bit in there, but for the most part, you go, well, okay, okay. You know, it's still enjoyable movies or whatever, but that just this video, like when I watched it the other night, I was like, you've got to be kidding me, you know? This comes out on Blu ray the same day as my birthday. Of course, that. Uh, sorry, the same day as Ghostbusters or something. What's really good here, like I say, because if it had ended there, that would have actually been awesome in a way. That would have ju just, just maybe that little bit there or something. That would have actually been, because how long has it been on for? Now, eighty minutes, maybe a little bit too short. But... Because what's funny as well, though, are like things in horror goes on like waves and cycles and stuff. But it's weird about something like this, though, because like on the one hand, it's like pretty original and pretty out there, and then I feel like it's kind of really derivative, and it reminds me of like all Black Christmas remake and you know Urban Legend or something. Uh, uh, you know those kind of movies. It, yeah, it's weird because like but then again, on the other hand, it's. Uh, a guy who's lives in a wall who's got a porcelain mask on. I mean, it's not, <laughs> it's not an everyday occurrence. Wait, I'm sorry, ask him. Should be running uh, out the door, not upstairs. <laughs> The new Scream series starts uh, in a couple of days, fully enough, for uh, season two. I only saw the first episode of the first series, but it was pretty good. Again, it kind of reminds me of that in a little way, because the new Scream mask is a little bit similar to that, actually, fully enough, thinking about it. But that's one of the great thing as well, you think about horror, though, now, with it, like... If you think like literally now, like talk about things like The Great Cabo, Captain Top the Caligari, and Natalie and Dead, you've got all those real proper classic movies. You got like the you know the silent era, and then you've got like you know the sixties and seventies, Texas and some Massacre, the eighties, twenty two, and then you have still got all these like things like this and all this you know horror TV shows and stuff, and you know you know they rebooting everything every five seconds, and John Carpenter's coming back to Halloween. I mean, it's a horror fun. It's a it's definitely a cool time to be around. I'm in the camera. My elbow. <laughs> you must have money, cut. And even that, though, as well, that's one thing as well where. Only if there's certain houses where you can run, run around in the walls behind the um, walls. <laughs> like this part here, this is what I was saying, where you see this part with the dress. I mean, that's so genius. I mean, it really is. Like, it's like he's made like a little dummy version of it or something. And then, again, where you've seen this a billion times in horror movies, like, say, Texas Chainsaw 3D and, um, the, again, the Freddy remake. Uh, I've heard uh, Robert Englund, that's about John Cobb's coming back. I've heard um, Robert Englund wouldn't mind coming back and doing a cameo in a new Elm Street film. It's not as Freddy, but just as, 
you know, the, a teacher or something, you know, a bit like an urban legend. It's all connects. Coincidence, man. It's first appearance of coincidence, man. Yeah, yeah, but when you've seen these kind of things where it's like somebody got a hidden lair or something. And again, I think again, that that's a great shot of all the uh, light coming through the, uh, the vents there. Uh, but yeah, I think that's like something that's really, really hard because sometimes it's like, oh, they're ridiculously scary and there's like a dead body hanging up in the corner or something. But that looked, quote unquote, realistic, you know. What's really funny though, because I've only seen this once, and I'm pretty sure they get away. You see Brams fixing the doll up again, but I can't quite remember if that's how he does all that. That's one thing as well. Like sometimes, like I sometimes pride myself on my memory, and especially for really geeky things, I remember all the really stupidest things. Like it's my like well, that's not a stupid thing, but somebody like Daniel Pearl working on this film. It's like, oh yeah, it's Daniel Pearl or whatever. Um, or you know that um, you know I missed it at the cinema or something like that, but then like I can I can see this film I'll probably watch this film another twenty times and you could probably say to me oh, I don't know <laughs> yeah no and even that that's quite like a neat touch in a way that like when you'll get like say a lot of horror film characters and you like you know they're wearing like I don't know a cool jacket or something which never happened but something like that and he's wearing like a grey cardigan again I think like it's one of those things like that sort of try and get that balance just right of like you know he's got to just be because he's been living in that wall it's like you know and then it's like And like I said before, that uncanny valley thing, but there's something quite, again, it ties in with the ventriloquist dummy thing, seemed like, say, technically, like a ventriloquist dummy. I think that's how I realise what I'm doing. I'm saying doll a lot in this, this commentary, I think, because it's more like a doll than a ventriloquist dummy. But when I talk about ventriloquist dummies, I say the word dummy. I think that's what I'm doing. But yeah, when he says there, like, get back, get back, and... Um, that's a that has an awesome shot there of the clouds above the um, above the house. Again, I love how stylized it is, and 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 not just even that though. That like, uh, again, I'm sure a lot of people would watch that. And go, oh yeah, clouds. <laughs> like like you know, it wouldn't be as if they did it on the day. I like the patterns on the door as well. Even that's what like now he's got like a beard and stuff and but like that I think is like little things like that that sort of why you being told off by a middle aged woman for <laughs> <laughs> So you pay good money for it. <laughs> so my joke we didn't do that joke. I like how the toys on the shelf as well, they kind of like, again the production design is really good, they're kind of quite generic but like, that's 101 Dalmatian there, but I guess you're allowed to have just a Dalmatian, right?
this would have been actually quite a it would have been massive spoilers but it would have been quite a good trailer anyway because like, what the hell is this about? <laughs> I did check what this guy done, but I can't remember if he was like a stuntman or an actor or both. Well, that's not weird. Uh, oh there that's a really cool like there might have been like some kind of wire there I'm not sure but that's really because you just sort of you don't really see people get thrown through the air like that much okay the camera says where it's focused then I think that's something as well though sometimes though that like like I'm amazed what does get through like from the BBFC you now that like they think so many films got banned years ago that had almost nothing in them and then like watching that spy last night in uh, the Paul Feig film and you know it's you know it's basically a comedy but that was so brutal in lots of ways and like there's one part where you saw this guy's penis and stuff and I'm pretty he was like a one of those big fake penises they have nowadays but you're like wow well, I'm sure and it was just like yeah, on sky you know on sky television I like that shot now of like the mist out the window I thought that was a um, a good scene maybe spoilers I should have said spoilers for that spy but um, spoilers for Texas 3D I love this one part where they're driving a van to these big metal gates and you see so many horror films and action films where they just b burst through some gates like triumphantly and they smash into these gates and it just stops because <laughs> they're these huge big gates and I thought that was really cool because you don't really see that in a, you know, a lot of that they, at the very least go through the barrier and then maybe flip the car over or something I like that kind of love thing she does that look kind of nervous. Uh, I don't know if this this has got the all the markings of an after the credit scene. I don't know if the um were meant to put it in after the credits and they thought nobody stick around so they put it in. Again Texas Chainsaw three D comes back on after the credits uh, any of those credit watchers out there like me. Are looking at you. Uh, the rule they put the rules up on the refrigerator on the wall. I'll have to try and remember those rules. I could probably go put them in the blog post. We'll get a, a still of the um uh, Joe that could be uh, but Joe was dead funny about this then this is like again where um he's the he's a prototype Norman Bates uh, uh he stuffs things. But like uh, sometimes I, I can imagine my dad saying something like this or I can tell I'm getting old in some ways because imagine how hard it would be to just put that back together again. I would be surprised if it'd be almost impossible. <laughs> like, you know, if somebody got like a porcelain doll and smashed it like that, not like just chipped a little bit off something, but literally just smashed it into like a thousand pieces. I wonder how long it would take to put something like that back together. <laughs> Great movie though, and like say another one to add to the uh, what do they call it? The um, say say pantheon is that a word? The the um, the arsenal. That's not a that's not a, well, it's a word. The um, the um, yeah, to those collection of uh, eventual quiz dummy movies. <laughs> I can't think of the word. It's still any coffee, goddammit. Kevin Guns. Check out the guns. David Hughes, Sarah Hughes. 
N G U N. That's uh, someone's like Corey you heard from No Treat No Surrender. Doll design, Todd Master, that could be interesting to get what they've done. I haven't got a <coughs> I don't have voice then. I haven't got a random crew member, so should we go with catering? Oh, there we go. Catering catering assistants. I thought that was funny. Greta standing, male standing, female standing, like the two separate I remember seeing that in the credits I was watching the other day. Catering provided by Simply Divine. Oh, see, they're always a pawn. They're always a pawn. Derek Hayes, by the way, Darren Hayes, 19, It's interesting as well, because I think there was like some CGI in this and it's like funny, it's probably none of it was on here, Brahms. <laughs> interesting bird, no, is that that, if you can hear it? Margaret Phillips. Siggy Fertzel, that's a Siggy. Super fixing title designed by N Tiles by Scott Letters. They always do the credits for some reason. I still to this day, because I come of the you know the eight people in the world that watch credits, but why there is only like one company that like does or does two seen that songs The Magic Flute, K six twenty, Act Two, The Holla Ranch. Uh, composed by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, the cello concerto E minor, OP, oh, oh, could, I couldn't even read it, so I was like, long. soundtrack on Lakeshore Records, that, that, that'll that be a cool, that'll be a hard to get soundtrack in about 10 years, two years. The filmmakers wish to thank their assistant. Hartley Park National Historic Site, Portrait of the Hillshire Family by David Goatley, oh, that could be, why did you go by that? It's quite funny, actually. Dolby Atmos and Selected Theatres. What's interesting about this, though, the number now, I'm sure the MPA number is on over 50,000, and this is 49996, so I hope it's been held back for a few years. Thanks for listening, and see you later. It's a terrible adventure, the Chris Voice, and I can move your lips. 